welcome you to the intro track of the Agedia Summit. Our first talk is entitled QA 101, an intro to the process and how to make it work, with our wonderful speaker, Nick Heikula. Uh, Nick began working in QA as a tester for Destinaire Studios, and he shook dozens of titles in various QA roles there, including uh, leading the testing on the Xbox Live Arcade PC multiplayer shooter Breach. Then he moved to Frogster Online in Germany to work on Free to Play at Memos as an associate producer, and now he works at Bungie as an associate test engineer. Nick has a fantastic talk to you. Take it away, Nick. Thank you. All right, uh, so today's talk is QA 101. Uh, I, as you can probably tell, I'm pretty young. I haven't spent a ton of time in the industry, but uh, I've learned some things in my in shipping a few titles, and hopefully some of the things that I've learned I can pass on to you guys. And uh, so don't expect any theories uh, coming from me because I don't think I'm uh, worthy of <laughs> uh, shoveling my theories your way, but um, hopefully you'll be able to take something uh, from my experiences onto your testing. Uh, so QA. QA, you know, what does it mean? It means a lot of different things to many different people. Uh, I've worked for publishers and been in publisher QA. That's probably what most of us might be familiar with. Uh, so the publisher works separate from the developer, and they're kind of uh, separated. And the developer does the, the coding and the design and all that, those sorts of things. And the publishing QA uh, gets builds shipped to them uh, electronically, uh, and they take a look at it. They have, and but there's kind of a, a big division between the publisher and the developer. Uh, development QA is kind of different, uh, so you probably heard maybe the term embedded QA. Uh, so these, these testers are really have their hands uh, a little deeper into uh, perhaps code. Uh, they might know what's going behind the scenes a little more than the publishing QA. So publishing QA, maybe you've heard the term black box testing, white box testing. Uh, so that just means you know one is looking at the screen, playing the game, uh, or developers might be development QA might be uh, running with debug information, uh, pretty much uh, a little more behind the scenes. Uh, there's also localization QA, uh, certification QA. Obviously Microsoft, Sony, they've got standards. Nintendo as well. Um, this has to do with with that. So there's a lot of different things, and just those there's those types of QA. Uh, and there's also the, the differences in genre. Being a tester for an MMO is extremely different than being a tester on a social game, uh, or a casual game, or a core game. Um, yeah, so uh, that's a general uh, synopsis of what QA is. I'm sure we all know that. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about one game that I've worked on. Uh, I think a good way of maybe sharing my experiences is talking in depth with one game. So that game is Breach, and this was a uh, multiplayer shooter for the XBLA platform and PC as well. So uh, what this game was all about was uh, it's a military shooter, think something Battlefield-esque. Uh, 16 players, it had a brand new engine, uh, and this engine supported fully destructible environments. It had four classes, unique weapons, perks, again, think Call of Duty, uh, gadgets for each class, uh, XP leveling system, uh, four different game types, and six levels with night iterations of uh, several levels as well. Now, uh, maybe you haven't heard of this game. Um, it sounds uh, kind of like a, a, a big undertaking. Uh, a little background on the project. So this was, this was developed by Atomic Games, uh, and you may or may not have heard of them. They, they were developing a game called Six Days in Fallujah, uh, which was a controversial game set in Iraq. Uh, obviously controversial. Uh, Konami picked it up for publishing and shortly thereafter dropped it because of controversy, uh, which made the title, uh, sent it into disarray and it wasn't, wasn't done. Uh, this game came after Six Days in Fluge. I used the same engine, used a lot of the same ideas, but was kind of a quick way to show uh, what this developer was trying to do uh, without being a full AAA police. So that's, that's what the game was about. Uh, that's what it's about. Here's the timeline. So testing begins November 2009. Uh, at this time in November 2009, they had first pass 
uh, on environmental <coughs> drugs, really, really basic. Um, one class was playable of those four. Three weapons were playable out of, uh, there are 16 weapons eventually, so only three playable at this time, and only one game type, TDM, which is super basic, uh, nothing near uh, some of the more um, advanced types. And the planned release was summer 2010, uh, which you get if doing some basic math, uh, it was about six months. Um, leaving time for certification and all of that. So an incredibly optimistic timeline, uh, probably a crazy timeline, but uh, we have to do it. Now, um, here's the QA team at the time. Uh, so the company, this game was published by Justineer Studios, developed by Atomic Games, uh, and it's kind of a, a unique relationship. Justineer owns Atomic Games, and there's a development side at the publisher as well. So these two companies, the publisher and developer, are tied very close to one another. Um, at the time, there was one QA manager, uh, one senior QA lead, that was me, uh, and two QA leads. So th this was the dedicated resources. Uh, and this is a 16 player multiplayer game. So obviously, um, we've got not too much to work with. And of all those uh, four dudes, pretty limited experience with online shooters. Uh, so, uh, where are we gonna go from there? So we've got a very short timeline, we've got very few people, so the first challenge of this development from the QA standpoint is staffing up. So because this, this game had 16, 16 players, obviously you need to fill uh, at least 16 seats, so we set a goal, we need at least 18 testers, um, and I, I should also mention Destiny Studio is located in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, I'm not sure where you guys are located. Right now I'm living in Seattle, uh, working at Bungie, uh, and <laughs> Seattle has it very, very good. You've got Microsoft here, you've got Nintendo here, and you've got all of these contract companies, uh, which are basically temp agencies for testers. You've got super experienced people, a wealth of testers. The Midwest, not so much. Uh, so uh, that was a, definitely a challenge. So how did we approach this problem? We need 18 dudes. Uh, this is a, not a basic, casual, simple game. It's, it, we're gonna need some experienced people. Uh, so uh, first thing first, uh, we've got, as I'm sure any QA group has, we've got a list of past contractors. People I've worked with in the past um, for temp, you know, temporary QA people. Use that, referrals, connections, if you, got a brother or a brother-in-law that's good at video games and he's smart, we want to know who he is. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that we did uh, for this project that we hadn't done before, there was a, a new game design program at a local college, it was a community college. Uh, so this this program had, had been out for maybe a couple of years. Uh, we didn't really know them, but we made contact because obviously we want some experienced people. This was uh, an absolutely fantastic uh, thing that we did. Uh, we were able to get, I think, 10, 10 dudes out of, I think we, we interviewed 20 people and we got 10 really, really good candidates out of those 20. Um, and it, it was just really nice to be able to have some people that had experience, or at least some understanding of the, the video games around the world. Uh, and a, another thing that I guess we, we really like to do is hire diverse types. So obviously this game is very similar to Call of Duty. We could hire just Call of Duty nuts uh, and that's it. Um, but uh, some of the best people that we had on staff were people that really didn't play too much of Call of Duty, uh, but they were intelligent, they were super hard working, uh, and they liked games in general. And I think those three things are things you gotta look for and have a balance of each. Uh, you need some guys that are super uh, experienced and amazing at these shooters. Uh, you also need people who are really smart and obviously need hard, hard working people. And those three things uh, have a balance of strengths. Uh, don't have just hardcore gamers, don't just have really intelligent people that don't know too much about games, uh, but try to try to make a balance. All right, so so we staffed up, we got a lot of people. Here is the, the basic organization. Again, this is super simple, especially uh, uh, after working with some different companies, uh, this chart is kind of ridiculous. But, uh, so we've got a QA manager, uh, who, so this is not a publisher, so the QA manager is able to spend some time on this project, uh, but while this development's going on, there's also, I think 10 projects were shipped while this game was, was being shipped. So casual uh, titles, smaller, smaller titles, obviously. 
so much left, uh, senior QA lead, uh, a late shift lead, and 16 contact testers split up between two, uh, two shifts. Um, and get a little more on that later. But, uh, so obviously, challenge two, you got 16 people. Uh, only three had ever tested before. So a lot of them were um, from this game design program. So they knew a little, about, a little bit about gaming, but not too much, or testing, I should say. Uh, so um, how do we train these people? Now this is something that, that I definitely care a lot about, is training new, new people. Uh, I've got a background as a teacher, I've got an education degree. Um, and this is one thing that I think is super important. Uh, so we did this, you know, a, a few different techniques. Obviously formal training sessions, uh, they're nice uh, to a point. So we started out maybe the first couple days, uh, a few hours each day with just uh, sitting in front of a screen and saying, here's a bug. Uh, here's how you write it, here's the title, here's a repro step, etc. Uh, that sort of, you know, lecturing, that sort of thing. Uh, then, obviously, just getting familiar with the game. Uh, a lot of people have never tested before, and I think one hurdle, at least one thing that I struggled with when I first tested, was just sitting in front of a computer screen, uh, playing a game for eight hours a day, or eight plus hours a day. Um, so just sitting them down and having them play the game for long stretches of time, I think is good, especially for people who've never tested. Uh, and another important thing is have leads own areas and have them teach others. And that's something that's really important. That's something uh, definitely that I've experienced at Fungi. Uh, they hire a lot of people, obviously, and as soon as you're hired, your strengths are found, and whatever strengths you have, you own that area. Even if it's your first, first second week, you own that area. And that, that is huge. Having that responsibility, thinking I need to look, I need to know about matchmaking. That's my area. Uh, you're given a wiki page. You need to own that page, um, and that's something that we did uh, here. Um, also, uh, meetings are important, and kind of giving giving people feedback on what's a good bug, what are good practices. Uh, you know, Joe had a kick-ass bug. Tell people about it and say why it's good. And uh, I guess I wouldn't just be like all of that. Wikis again. Um, I think it's a great thing. And not just to have a wiki, but also to have the process of people creating their own wiki. Uh, this makes people masters at whatever it is they're doing. It forces them to uh, communicate with the developer. If they're owning, uh, say, matchmaking, they've got to talk with the uh, network engineer and get particulars, and uh, that really helps out. Definitely. It's a, that's a really good thing. All right, so we got our guys. Uh, and, and a couple girls, I should say. Uh, we decided to break up into multiple shifts. So again, uh, this is a title has a six month development cycle. Uh, and one, one, obviously one thing we do not want to happen is for QA to be the reason that this game doesn't ship in six months. And I, I think this is something that maybe it happens a lot, very optimistic development timelines. And a lot of uh, pressure is obviously put on QA to not fail, to not be the ones that, that cause the, uh, that are the choke point. Um, so we broke up into two shifts, a day shift and a night shift, and uh, had a few hours of overlapping to test the 16 players. Uh, so obviously, we only had 20 testers um, and split into two shifts, uh, and we didn't have 16 players throughout the whole day. Uh, so we had play sessions for 16 players uh, during those overlaps. And how we did this, because we had a bunch of noobs, um, usually in places that I've worked, uh, testers are kind of left to their own devices uh, and under leads, and um, they can do some ad hoc testing, uh, testing that they, you know, they need to be done. We did not <laughs> allow any of that, uh, just because uh, we had a lot of new people, and uh, we had very, very structured test plans and a super rigid schedule rigid to the point of we are taking our breaks at this time altogether. We are having our lunches at this time altogether. Uh, and you know, obviously that sounds kind of like fascist, but <laughs> I think it worked very well in this, uh, in this, uh, this game. Um, it probably wouldn't work for everyone. Obviously, it's nice to have um, some organic structuring and, and not be so rigid, but for this, for our purposes, I think it worked pretty well. So we had 20, 20 testers a night and day shift. Um, one huge problem that we ran into uh, just a, a few short weeks in was a slow bug fixing. So, uh, and most of this was caused by a small dev team. So there are six engineers in total. 
So this is network engineer, uh, um, the main engine, and, engineer and some junior engineers as well. So that's that's it. Six engineers, two designers, and it would go down to one in development. So which means every single design bug is being fixed by one guy, uh, and every every uh, every other bug is split up between six people, um, which was was insane. I think at, after maybe four weeks, we had uh, 2,000 open bugs um, for this small team. And we were used to having uh, a bug database for a title because we're a, a mostly casual company. Uh, maybe 1,000, that was what we peak at. Uh, that, that's what we top out at. We hit that after a month, um, which totally uh, scared the hell out of developers, <laughs> um, especially given the short time limit. Uh, so one thing we, we did with this is uh, triage. So we would break down bugs uh, and say this bug needs to be fixed by this milestone, this bug needs to be fixed by this milestone, and we really went nuts uh, with that. And we would have daily meetings with uh, whatever engineering lead uh, for each for each area. We would, we would go through a list of bugs and say which bugs need to be fixed, how long is each, each bug going to take to be fixed, uh, and this was something that we had to do every day because of the huge influx of bugs. We didn't want something to get lost. Um, and I think that's an important thing. Um, bug triage is uh, very important, especially when you're dealing with a huge uh, list of bugs. All right, so another challenge, and this stems from uh, the huge influx of bugs and the long, <laughs> long bug fixing. So this is probably something a lot of us are familiar with, is the QA developer animosity. I hate this, uh, but I've seen it so often. Um, for some reason, I don't know why, but uh, testers especially, um, the publishing side, there is a lot of friction between developers, and for some reason, uh, they think of themselves on opposing sides. Uh, a bug gets closed and people take it personally, uh, or a bug is written uh, kind of in a snarky tone and a developer really takes offense. Um, this is, and this, this title, uh, so we had two shifts, and we've always experienced this QA de development uh, animosity, but this was, was kind of bad because we had one night lead uh, who was definitely poisoning the well uh, towards the developer. But again, this is, this is a company that, an umbrella company owns both the publisher and developer. Uh, so there's kind of some unique things going on there. One side of the company was not doing very well, one side of the company doing, was doing very well, and that kind of led to that. Um, anyway, uh, also some kind of patronizing books. So I talked earlier, we got a lot of these people from Game Design College. So some of these people were experts in game design. And they knew how to do things much better than developers. Uh, so we had every bug go through uh, a lead, uh, at least. But there were a couple that got through uh, with um, kind of a patronizing tone. And that definitely was not good. Um, so how, how do we deal with this? Uh, I think one thing that's important is it's easy to only communicate with through the bug database. And <laughs> you're not communicating with a human, it's a name, uh, and, and there's really no, no connection there. And I think it's good, obviously you can't, not everyone can do this because these, these companies were kind of joined at the hip. Uh, we had a video conference system, so we would do meetings uh, with video conference as much as we could. And we would, we would uh, also have, we would try to facilitate communication. So if someone had a question about a bug, uh, say a bug got sent back to QA um, by a developer asking for questions or clarification, we wouldn't just respond, or we would try to uh, have people open an IM chat with the person uh, or call them, uh, because we were the same company, our phone system worked really well with one another. Uh, so we really tried to have people communicate with the, the, uh, the actual engineers and designers um, and, and that definitely helped. And obviously, uh, had to talk with the problem lead and really had the, the lead set the tone. Um, but that's something, and this is a problem with that I've seen in a lot of different titles, um, there are a lot of different projects, and I guess it's something that you just have to nip in the bud really quick and really try to set the tone um, and don't let that happen. So obviously, the, the developers are there uh, for a reason, testers are there to you know serve them uh, to some extent, and uh, you can't really both of them need one another. Yeah, so uh, huge number of bugs, slow bug fixing, uh, the decision to delay the title. Uh, so this was obviously a tough decision by the higher ups. And another, the company was not doing very well at this time. So uh, it was brought up that we need to uh, temporarily 
downside the QA team. Um, we had a ton of bugs, uh, so the QA department was, obviously we didn't want to do this, but we had a huge ton of bugs. There was a lot of wasted testing effort going on because these bugs weren't getting fixed. Uh, you can only test so much on a broken build. Uh, so, for seven weeks, we had four testers uh, on a 16 player game. Um, this was to allow the dev team to, to fix bugs, and we would have these four guys uh, regress bugs, make sure things are fixed, and do some uh, BB, like build verification tests on new builds, and that was about it. Uh, this turned out to be a huge mistake. It totally killed momentum both from the QA standpoint and the development standpoint. Uh, when you're not getting any bugs, or, or if you're going from 200 bugs a day to two bugs a day, uh, obviously your um, in incentive to work your ass off is kind of lost. And we also ended up losing some testers for good. Uh, so obviously, uh, and that's, that's a common problem with um, testing. So we got these testers back, 13 back, for the final push. Uh, so one shift only, no more day shift, night shift. It was crunch mode, uh, 9 a.m. to uh, to be decided. <laughs> um, and this was also the time when we edited certification testing. So obviously we had a tiny team. We did not have a dedicated certification tester. This was left for the leads, um, and this is something we had to do in addition to our other testing. The only thing we outsourced was our localization testing because we just did not have the resource to do that. Uh, so we outsourced that, but did certification and everything else uh, under our roof. Uh, and this is also the time, so this is a multiplayer game, we did uh, some network stress testing. Uh, and some of the tools that we used for this uh, would have been, uh, I'm not sure uh, how familiar you are with Xbox development, but the XDK uh, is really, really useful. They've got a lot of good Microsoft tools. Uh, so there's, there's network tools where you can choke uh, the network activity so you can simulate uh, really, really bad connections with certain machines, uh, or you can, you can simulate lost packets, that's, things like that. So there's a lot of uh, cool testing you can do. Because obviously we had 16 testers, we didn't have a huge core of people. Um, that was about all we were able to do. Uh, also, uh, so we had 300 open bugs in database at ship. There's a huge, huge, huge push to get the game out the door. Uh, the company was not doing well. We needed this game to get out. Uh, and we did so uh, with many, many, many known issues uh, in, in the game. So obviously not a good idea to do that. The game is released, uh, and we're pretty pretty uh, proud of We think we're doing all right. Uh, we had a, some review sessions. So this is the, really the first time we're able to uh, stress test the game. So we had maybe 500 people playing. Uh, we sent out review codes for just about any blog, every blogger ever, uh, every publication ever. And so we had about 500 people, maybe 500 to 1,000 people playing at the same time. Uh, it was really smooth. We were really impressed. The reviews, I think we had an OXM uh, review, got to give it an 80, which we were pretty happy with. Oh, yeah, it's going to be good. Uh, as soon as the game released, massive, massive lag issues, uh, unforeseen matchmaking problems. And a lot of these things stem from the fact that we were never able to have more than hundreds of people testing. Uh, and, and, and this is a problem that I think any, uh, lots and lots of online games have. Uh, Diablo 3 obviously is uh, the most recent uh, example. Obviously I'm not comparing this game with Diablo 3, but if problems like that can affect Diablo 3, it can affect Blizzard, which has somewhere around 4,000 people uh, under just the Blizzard roof, not counting Activision, the publishing side, which I'm sure can help, uh, it's crazy. Uh, so, um, another thing, uh, because the company was in, in peril, uh, the team was moved on to other projects immediately after this title was shipped. Uh, and that led to a delay in the title update. And I think it was a huge, huge mistake. Um, and and one, one lesson learned from this issue is obviously we needed more testing uh, network-wise, um, but it was, it was a total mistake to a mistake of hubris to think that we're gonna release this game and we wouldn't need a title update right away. Uh, so obviously one lesson, if you're doing a multiplayer game, you need as much network testing as possible. We didn't do a beta. Uh, in retrospect, I wish to God we had done some sort of beta, cold beta, or open beta, that would have helped. Uh, there were 800,000 people who tried the demo. Uh, and so obviously this is an XAA title, so the demo's free, uh, but because it's an online title, 
everyone who's playing the demo is also playing online. So it's as if 800,000 people are playing there, obviously not at the time, but a huge amount of people, um, something that we were never able to replicate with our tiny, tiny team. Uh, also, another thing that, that we learned, this QA break did much more damage than good. Um, in retrospect, I, we never would have uh, allowed this to happen. It, it totally messed things up. Another lesson, and this is something that I've definitely learned um, uh, working with other companies, um, automation is huge. Um, and also the lack of QA experience in, in the first person online shooter genre definitely hurt us. So that's the, uh, um, that was the game. So here's some, some basics about the, a, a good QA team. Uh, and this is definitely something I've, I've learned with working with other companies. Um, a core group of full-time test leads. So obviously this is something we, we, we had a core group uh, for this title. Um, they need to be knowledgeable, they need to be teachers, because these are the people who are going to be training contract testers. Uh, totally skimp on contract testers, that's cool, pay them minimum wage or you know, $10, $10, $12 an hour, that's fine. But do not uh, do, treat these people well, because these are the people who are going to be training these newbies that you're going to be bringing in every time you scale up uh, for the holiday season or, or whatever. Uh, also, culture of QA importance. Uh, QA needs to be important. This is something that's obviously difficult to do if it's not already there. Uh, but make inroads producers. Teach them why QA is important. Uh, really try to instill in the company that QA is important. Um, and, and also, ever expanding the tools. Tools are important. Um, I'm going to kind of hurry up here because I'm running out of time. Uh, I already said that. So, obviously, right now I'm, I'm, I'm not at Destiny anymore. I'm at Bungie. Uh, a very, very different place. I wish I could talk more about what I'm doing at Bungie. Obviously, I can't. Uh, maybe sometime in the future I could do that. But some things that they do very, very well, uh, this, this culture of importance that I talked about earlier, the president of Bungie came from test. Uh, if you look at the Halo credits, uh, the original Halo game, the tester list, I think four of the original testers are now either senior engineers uh, or are in charge of infrastructure, super high positions. So you've got a, a, a core of high up people who are uh, come from QA. And QA is very, very important at Bungie because of that. Uh, and that's something obviously you can't really do. It's just there, but uh, it really, really helps. Um, and then wrapping up, because we're, again, running out of time. Working QA can be great. I don't know if any of you have gone to the, the website Trenches, which is a, a, a web comic uh, <laughs> devoted to by the Penny Arcade guys to go into QA. If you read some of the, the stories, the tales, uh, they're horrifying. Uh, <laughs> and they make, make QA look and sound horrible. Uh, probably a lot of that is from contractors, but it can be awesome. I was an associate producer. I left that position to come to Bungie uh, as a test engineer. And I do not regret that for a moment. Uh, a lot of people thought it was crazy to do that, but I, it's, it's amazing. I love it. Uh, QA definitely can be great, and don't forget that. And also, uh, working QA doesn't have to be just a stepping stone. A lot of people try to get out of QA as fast as possible. Uh, again, I'm, I'm at Bungie. Some of the people there in the test group, they, they're not going anywhere. They're staying in QA. Uh, they love their job. They're amazing at their job. Uh, and uh, I think it's important for people to realize that QA is not just a, a stepping stone, but it can be a final destination. And that's, that's about it. Yeah, you guys have any questions? Did you do certification first pass? Yes, we we did we did a, a first pass. Um, there were uh, there was one crash that was found by Microsoft certification. So uh, you did you did which pass they waived, which they waived. Waived. Yep. Uh, which is something that we had never done before. Uh, I had led the testing on a couple of different 360 titles, uh, and they had never waived a crash before. But it was it was a rare crash tied to networking and. and they, um, Thank you very much. We don't have time for any additional questions. Thank you, Nick, and thank you all for coming. Uh, stick around for the next talk. Be up after a short break.